back there for it to continue, I should say. And then I'll put the first Thessalonians. So we're up to the end of chapter 2. First Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, verse 17 to 19. And uh, it reads, But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavoured the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. Uh, for what is our hope, or joy, or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are our glory and joy. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for being able to just uh, come aside again this afternoon to, uh, Lord, open your word to delve into its riches once again. And Father, I just do pray as we do so, uh, Lord, that it would be uh, instructive to our hearts, a uh, challenge to our hearts, uh, Lord, that it would uh, be a reminder to us. And uh, Father, I, I, Lord, just uh, do ask that the Holy Spirit of God would be doing those things as we uh, as we delve into your riches of your word. And so, Father, I, I Lord, do thank you for that. Lord, I give you all the praise, glory, and honor, and I ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So here we have Paul, uh, as we looked at a few weeks ago, stating that he was hindered from going to the Thessalonians once and again by Satan, even though he had not long been there. And uh, you know, we looked at the, the, the time between when they left, left Thessalonica and Paul wrote to them. It was only a short period of time. It was only a matter of months. And if you look at the end of your um, the end of the epistle, if you've got there where, where they say where it was written, it says in mine, it says it was written from Athens. But uh, there's you know, thought there that it wasn't necessarily Athens, but uh, from Corinth. Uh, but only a short time after he left, uh, he wrote this epistle to them, uh, obviously out of concern and care for them. But uh, we've seen how uh, Paul, in the short time that he did minister there, had a great attachment to the church at Thessalonica, and, uh, and that was probably, probably a, a big part born uh, because of uh, how, in the midst of persecution, uh, they accepted the word of God uh, with great joy and they've stuck with it. And, uh, and that persecution continued long after Paul was gone. Now, uh, here in uh, verse number 17, when you think about this a few weeks ago, uh, Paul uh, saying there, said they've been taken from you for a short time in presence, uh, not in heart. You stop and you think about that, even though, uh, even though it hadn't been long since they were taken from the presence of the Thessalonians, uh, their heart was still there with them. And, uh, and we see that borne out in verse number uh, 18. He said, Wherefore we would have come unto you, even I Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. So uh, it was the thing of they had that urgency to go back, uh, basically pretty, you know, pretty much you know, straight away, uh, but that wasn't to be. And, uh, and Satan hindered them in doing that. And then in verse 19, uh, and it says, Therefore, what is our hope? Now remember, when you're talking about in relation to the things of God, God's uh, promises are sure. Uh, God's hope is is a is a certainty, uh, a certain expect a certainty of expectation. And uh, if God's hope is not something that is ever going to fail, and so Paul saying that he said, "For what is our hope, or joy, or crown of rejoicing?" Now, uh, where he says there the crown of rejoicing. He is actually literally meaning uh, a crown of rejoicing, a crown in the sense of uh, when he would appear before the Lord, he was going to, they were going to get a crown for, for, their, for them being a faithful witness to, uh, not just to the Thessalonians, but to many people in, in the uh, place that he went. Now, I want to think about that for a minute. It, it's talking about one of the crowns awarded at the judgment seat of Christ uh, when we were judged for our works as a Christian not to be one. 
and uh, not the wording of work at the end of verse 19, he said, are not ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? It's talking about the time uh, where, where not just the Thessalonians, but uh, you know, the people of Philippi, etc., uh, will, you know, that they will be there, and and uh, and Paul is going to get a crown of rejoicing for for being a faithful witness. And you say, are you sure that's a, a literal crown? Yes, let's have a look. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter four. We'll go over there next. 2 Timothy chapter four, and have a look. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter four. We will go back to um, Thessalonians. But in 2 Timothy chapter four, look at verses six to eight. Paul writes here, he was about to be martyred, he said, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Uh, this is about 67 AD, when he, when he was martyred. He said, I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Now look what comes next. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. So the Lord literally was going to give to Paul, or will give to Paul, um, uh, at the and we'll see the time in a moment uh, at that day, but not to me only, but unto also uh, unto them also that love his appearing. So it's talking about the Lord literally giving a crown as a reward. And uh, and so the crown of rejoicing that we saw back in First Thessalonians uh, is a, is a literal crown, and there are actually five crowns of reward uh, that can be given. And let me just add this in here. We don't try to do these things to earn a reward. It, God is going to reward us as He knows for what He knows we've done just for, from a sincere, genuine heart to serve Him. It's not something that you just going to go, well, if I do it, if I, if I witness to three more people this year, I should get a pen of rejoicing. No, no, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. It's just God looking down on the sincerity of our hearts and He'll reward us for, for, for the sincerity of our hearts in these areas that He will give, uh, give crowns as rewards for. Now looking there in verses 6 to 8, it says, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love His appearing. So it's talking about the time of the Lord Jesus Christ's appearing, and if you compare that to... First uh, Thessalonians chapter 2 uh, and verse 19 it says are not ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming it's talking about the same time about the second coming of Christ uh, and why what's going to happen at the second coming of Christ okay well let's go to second Corinthians chapter 5 and we'll see second Corinthians chapter 5 and second Corinthians chapter 5 we'll see what what happens at the Lord Jesus Christ's uh, second coming when he takes us home to be with him forever in heaven now, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, have a look in verse number 10. It says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one of that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Okay, so we all must. Who is the we all must? All of the born again believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is writing here to born again believers, he's not writing to the unsaved. And this, he's not talking there about when he says the judgment seat of Christ. He's not talking of the great white throne judgment at the end of the millennium. Uh, no, he's not. He's talking about the individual judgment for Christians as born again believers where they receive a reward or don't receive a reward. And you can study that yourself in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 11 to 15. So, at the, at the judgment seat of Christ, some of the rewards that will be given out will be crowns. Again, not we don't try to get brownie points so we can go, well, oh, tick that crown off, I'm going to get that one. Oh, no, 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 not at all. It is just from sincerely trying to serve the Lord in the areas that, that He is going to give the rewards for, the crowns for. It's not done for an ulterior motive. It's not done from a, you know, with, a, with a false... A false reasoning. It's it will be the, 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 the sorry the crowns will be given for a genuine heartfelt love for the Lord and service for Him in the areas that He gives them for. So a thought. The Lord Jesus Christ took a crown of thorns on His holy brow in suffering for your sins and mine, 
but gives us the opportunity to receive crowns for being faithful in different aspects of our lives when we don't really deserve to even have eternal life. You think about that. He had a crown of thorns jammed on his head in suffering for your sins and for mine. And because of his sacrifice on the cross, the King of the Jews, as he was called on the cross, paid for your sins and for mine that we can have eternal life, which ultimately we don't deserve. But then, instead of us getting the crown of thorns, uh, we had the opportunity, just from loving the Lord and living for Him, to have uh, some of these crowns that He's got for rewards. So let's have a look at these five crowns just for a little while this afternoon. Uh, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And in 1 Corinthians 9, have a look in verses 25 to 27. Paul there, he says uh, in verse 25, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertain, uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So verse 25 is talking about the incorruptible crown and uh, it's given the name uh, by, down through the ages, ages it's been given the name of the victor's crown. And so just basically it's in respect of being temperate or moderate in all things in our lives. And uh, it's being able to say no to things in our lives that we ought to say no to. And to, to keeping our bodies, as Paul said there, keeping our bodies under subjection uh, to the Lord, obviously. And so to appreciate what Paul is saying here, remember the church at Corinth, when Paul wrote this first epistle, uh, they were deep in various types of sin. They had real, a real lot of problems. And, uh, and they obviously had no moderation uh, or temperance. Uh, the temperate there in, in, this, in, this verse, in these verses basically means uh, the same as moderation or being moderate. And they had not learned to shun or even to flee from the evil. They had no restraint in respect of those things that were wrong before the Lord. So to be temperate or in moderation uh, in this sense is to be restrained from that which is not pleasing uh, to God. So here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 25 to 27, Paul is showing his heart for them, rebuking them on one hand, but on the other side, reminding them on, about how important their walk with the Lord is by the fact that the Lord will reward the genuine believer, the heart, uh, the, the believer with a, a good heart for God. Uh, and, and, and it shows in their life with, uh, with moderation or being temperate. Number two, the crown of rejoicing, which we've already started, we started on that one over 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And uh, it's often called the soul winner's crown. And it goes for those that, be, that go beyond their old nature to give the gospel to others. To give the gospel to, to other people, even though we have the Holy Spirit of God within us, uh, if we are not close to the Lord in our relationship with Him in, the, in this area, where we don't have a, a, as much of a burden for the lost as what we ought, it becomes harder to give the gospel to someone. When we, when we have uh, a mindfulness of what we will appear to be to, to the unsaved by giving them the gospel, when we, we, we let that become something that bothers us, we won't be effective as a witness. And you know, we understand that it is not us individually that wins anyone to Christ. It is the Word of God that does the work. And, uh, and so, as I would take this to be, you know, in this country where people are not as receptive to the Word of God as in other countries, like third world countries tend to be a whole lot more open to the Word of God and to the Gospel. In this country where things are, are, are not as, where people are not as receptive, uh, and this is just my opinion, 
if I'm wrong, well, sorry about that, but you know, I, I look at this particular crown as being someone that just faithfully puts out the word of God, knowing that God will do with that what he, what he pleases. And yes, we, we do hope that from all of the seed that gets sown, that, that some of those people come to know Christ as the Lord and Saviour, even if we don't see it. If you think about the parable of the sower, you know, you have the, you know, the sower just goes out and just gets the word of God out. Some goes on the, on, the, on the pathway, the hard ground, some goes amongst the stones, some goes amongst the thorns, some falls on the good ground. Our job is just to get the word of God out there. So let me add something in here. You know, uh, on Friday when we're out tracking, you know, we're, we're going along and there was a lady that just came, what got home, and she was just, you know, she just emptied a mailbox and I thought, I thought I, I would have rather put it in the mailbox rather than give it to her direct. You might say, why, are you, are you worried about giving it to her? No. But what I'm about to say will bear out what I'm thinking. So I went up to her and I thought, oh, okay, look, I'll give it to her. So I got up to her and said, could I give you this? And she, she took one look at it and she went, no, thanks. And so therein lies why I like to just put them in their mailbox rather than try to go and you know, give them to the person in some way. Because at least 9 out of 10 are going to say, no thanks. At least, even though we don't, you know, may not put them in the no junk mail, uh, at least 8 or so out of that 10 are going to get a gospel track whether they want it or not. And so, better to get 8 out of 10 in, a mail, in mailboxes than to maybe get 1 out of 10 that will take it. And it's up to the Lord because it's His Word that does the work, not me and not you. And so we are just to, to, to be faithful witnesses for the Lord, trusting that He will get from His Word what He, what he sets, it to get, sets it out to, to, uh, to achieve. And, and yes, of course, it's a real blessing when God gives us the natural opportunity to speak to someone. You're having a conversation with someone and the conversation just goes along and the Lord just opens a door in that conversation where it's just natural to talk about the things of God. That, that, that's wonderful. I love that when, that when the Lord does that. Now, brethren, we are just to be faithful in seeking to be a witness for the Lord as much as we can. And the results are in God's, in God's hands. Does it mean that uh, even if you, you might have witnessed to or shared a bit of the gospel with with a hundred people in a year or, and put out, put out thousands of tracks, uh, if you don't see any result from that, does that mean that you're not going to get a reward? Uh, I think the Lord looks at, at the heart and why we're doing that and our desire towards those people. I think that's really what counts. Um, you know, the Lord knows the reality of that, but that's how I see it. Uh, if we don't convert anybody, He does, when, when they get convicted by the Word of God. So brethren, keep on going. Don't fall by the wayside in getting the gospel out. Don't let the fear of man bring a snare in your life where, where you're afraid to say a word fitly spoken when God gives you an opportunity to someone. If God's giving you the opportunity, he's saying, speak. So speak when he does. Let's go up to Acts chapter 11 and have a look in uh, verses 19 to 21. Acts chapter 11 verses 19 to 21. In Acts chapter 11, verses 19 to 21, it says, And now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen travelled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, and which, when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. So here we see the Jews from the dispersion, they, from, from the persecution in Jerusalem. Uh, we know from Acts chapter 8 that all of the believers from Jerusalem, uh, they scattered uh, away from Jerusalem because of the persecution, uh, except for the apostles. And uh, you find that at the beginning of Acts chapter 8. Now... Uh, these, these particular believers, they're, they're, they're fleeing from persecution. 
they're getting away from persecution. And so you might say, well, they, have, they would have a good reason to, to just sort of lay low a little bit because you know, they, might get, they might get arrested and thrown in jail. But here we have ordinary, everyday, born-again believers, uh, wherever they went, and we can see there in those verses that uh, they, in all these different places that they went, they're still preaching the gospel. They're still giving the gospel out. That's ordinary, everyday believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, not just the ministers. It's for all of us to get the gospel out. And, and again, we, we're not doing it to go, well, if I give out 5,000 tracts this year, I might get a crown of rejoice. No, not, not for the wrong reason, but just because we have a burden for the lost. And we love the Lord that, that paid the price for our sins on the cross and we want others to know. Number three, the crown of righteousness. Go back to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Again, this is where Paul was about to be martyred. And Paul's statement in verse number 7 shows that through fighting a good fight, finishing his course and keeping the faith, that he had laid up for him a crown of righteousness. And that's what he's saying. Read verse 7 and 8 together. He says, well, not together, but he's, you know, follow it with me. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Verse 8, henceforth. Henceforth. There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. We'll think about the rest of the verse in a minute. So Paul is saying because he had, uh, he had fought a good fight, he finished his course. In other words, despite the struggles and everything that was going on in his life and the, and the uh, persecution that he experienced in, in many, many forms and, and, and times, uh, he kept on fighting that good fight. He kept on going in that struggle and he, and he did it right to the very end of his life. He finished his course in that, in that situation. And therefore he had kept the faith. And because of that, he had a crown of righteousness awaiting him. Now, now let me say this to you. Uh, God just wants you to stay faithful in, in, your, in your life. If you're where God wants you to be, doing what God wants you to do, uh, and you might say, but it's a struggle, keep fighting. Keep struggling. Keep leaning on the Lord in that struggle. Like I said this morning, if we're really leaning on the Lord, if we really draw nigh to the Lord in our walk with him, uh, even though life is a struggle for any of us at times, He will help you through that struggle. Keep fighting the good fight. Don't give up before the end of your course. In other words, keep the faith. And so, uh, looking at the rest of verse 8 there, He said, uh, and not to me only, in other words, it wasn't just Paul that was going to get the crown of righteousness, it wasn't a special crown just for Paul. He said, but unto all them also that love his appearing. You might say, well, what does that mean? It doesn't say love him at his appearing. It just says all them that love his appearing. Well, I think you'll agree that if you are continuing on in the struggle that we call life, if you keep on in that struggle right through till the Lord either takes you home from the natural end of your life or the rapture occurs, uh, then you'll have kept the faith till the end. In other words, you're showing the Lord at His appearing at that time that you see the Lord face to face, you're showing Him that you love Him. That's, that's what it would mean. Will God say to you, will the Lord Jesus look you in the face at that moment that you pass to the other side, whether it be the rapture or natural death, will he look at you and go, well done, you, you finished your course because you kept, the, you kept fighting the fight right to the end and you kept the faith. Will he say that to you? Will he? That's what God wants to say. That's what he wants to be able to say to each and every one of us. He wants us to give a, wants to give us the crown of righteousness, but you know, uh, we need to be loving His appearing. We need to be showing through our lives that we are continuing to fight the good fight and to finish our course and, and keep the faith. We're doing that to show the Lord that we genuinely love Him from the right heart. Let's have a look in Revelation chapter two. Revelation chapter two. Revelation chapter 2, and 
And we see here at the beginning of the chapter um, John being instructed to write to the church at Ephesus, over which he was the bishop at that time. And uh, it's interesting. Here we had a, 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 a man by the name of John, the beloved disciple, the one that was closest to the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, and, uh, and he's the bishop of the church. Now you would think a man that loved the Lord as much as he did, you would think that that, that love that he had towards the Lord would really be a big influence on the, on the church, wouldn't you? But have a look at what the Lord said there through John to the church at Ephesus. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labour, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast laboured, and hast not fainted. You would say, boy, here's a church that's really fighting a good fight. Uh, they, they're going to finish their course because they, they, they have, they're so faithful and they love the Lord. But look, look at what's next. next. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent. They'd left their first love. Who's that? The Lord. They weren't in love with the Lord. They were doing all of those things mechanically by this time. Well, this is what we do because we've got to do it. Would you say then that they were showing their love for the Lord? If the Lord had come right at that moment, would the Lord say, you love that, that they loved him at his appearing? Or would he say, You didn't love me? You left your first love. You might have been doing all of these things physically. You might have laboured and, and, and you had patience and you can't bear the evil. And you've tried them which say they're apostles and are not and found them, and has found them liars. Those are all right and good things. But were you doing all of those things because you love me? According to what the Lord said there, no. Would they have got the crown of righteousness? Well, that's not for me to judge. That's for the Lord to, to judge, obviously. But, I, but you have to wonder. Brethren, let me say this. And, and the, what I'm just saying there just bears out what I said earlier. We don't do things for the wrong reason. We don't do things to, be, to get branding points with God, so I give, hey Lord, that, what do you reckon? That should give me a bit, of, a bit more reward, hey? No, no, not at all. We should be just doing what we do because we love the Lord. And if he gives us a reward, well then, that's a, that's a, that's a blessing that we don't deserve. Praise the Lord for that. Number four, crown number four is the crown of life. Have a look in, in two places. Uh, we've got Revelation chapter 2, so keep that there, but let's go to James chapter 1 first. James chapter 1 first, this particular crown is mentioned twice. And we'll start with James chapter 1, to, uh, it, ex it explains it a bit better. James chapter 1, and look at verse number 12. James chapter 1 verse 12, James wrote there, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried... He shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. See that word love there again? It revolves around our love for him, doesn't it? Why are you going to give out the gospel? You're thinking about the, the, uh, the, uh, the crown for soul winning. Why do you give out the gospel? Because you love the Lord and you're so thankful for what he's done for you. Um, crown of righteousness that we just looked at. Here we have... The next one, the crown of life, uh, in verse number 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life. Now, that's not talking about gaining eternal life. You're either saved or you're not. 
but it's talking about resisting temptation. It's quite plain and quite, quite clearly set out there. Remember, it was temptation that brought about the fall of man in Genesis chapter 2 and 3. Remember, it was temptation that the devil used to try and tempt the Lord Jesus and fail, of course. Uh, and as we know, Hebrews chapter 4, uh, verse 15 says, He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. He never, never accepted one. And remember, it is temptation that the devil loves to use on you and me to get us to foul up in our walk with the Lord. Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, with those things in mind, Revelation 2, verse 10, the Lord writing uh, through, uh, through John to the, uh, to the, to the believers in, uh, in Smyrna, and you see it starts there in verse number 8, he says to the believers there, so people that are already born again, they already have eternal life, fear none of those things which sh thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast, thou, cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have, tri have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. So in other words, the Lord is saying there, when you, you think about what we've looked at in James chapter 1, it, it, it explains what the crown of life is. It's not giving eternal life. They've already got it. It's the church at Smyrna, born-again believers. It's not writing to unbelievers. And so he's saying there, be faithful unto death, and they'll give you the crown of life. In other words, resist the temptation to, <clears throat> to go back on, on, on to deny me. Uh, and, and through the centuries, that's what, the, you know, that's what a certain religion would do with Christians. They'd put them at the stake and say, deny Christ or you burn. And, and, and many of them would go, I cannot deny my Lord and Savior. Some did, some denied the Lord. And that's what it's talking about there. He's saying, resist the temptation to deny me. Stay faithful, in other words, as it says there. And, and you have the crown of life. You get that reward, that crown at the judgment seat of Christ. And we trust that in this day and age, that none of us will ever face something like that. But nonetheless, we do face the fiery trial day in, day out of temptation. And, and it comes in, in at us like a flood. And brethren, let me say this. Uh, you might say, well, I fail. We all do. We all have the old nature. But what makes the difference is when, when, when we fail, it bothers us. And we go to the Lord and, and say, God, I'm so sorry. God, help me to overcome that, that, that temptation, that weakness that I have in my flesh. Help me next time it comes around to be to be mindful that it's heading my way, uh, to be able to resist it and to be able to get the victory over it through the work of the Holy Spirit of God in my life. And God looks at your heart and, and He sees a genuine desire when we do it that way and He will help us. And He does. James chapter 1 again, blessed is the man, happy is the man that endureth temptation. It's a, it's a blessing. It, it, it's such a joyful thing when you know God has given you help to overcome a temptation in your life. Imagine, and God, you get up to heaven, if you've had that, you've had that heart to resist temptation, and, and you've been casting yourself and got at the Lord's feet to, to get victory over it, and you get up there and he gives you a crown for that just because you did what he wanted you to do and you've experienced the blessing of getting victory in your life. You don't deserve that. But that's what he wants, that's what he wants to do. And that's what he will do. So let me ask you a question. We've had four crowns so far. Will you have a crown when you get there? I, mean, I don't mean doing, doing things for the wrong reason. Again, I'll say that. But will you have a crown when we get to heaven? And for what? What will God give? What would God give you a crown for? Out of those things that we've looked at, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not trying to say anything about anybody. I'm not trying to judge anybody. But I'm making you to think for yourself. What could I possibly get a crown for, for for my service to the Lord, for my life before the Lord, thinking about how my life has been, 
do I think that possibly I've had the right heart before God and really love the Lord in one of these areas or, or more? And it's not, a, it's not a challenge to then, like I said, it's not a challenge to be fake and try to earn something. But it should be a challenge to make sure we're in love with our Lord and our Saviour. A genuine love for the Lord. The fifth and final, and we'll, we'll close with this one so far, obviously. 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. Have a look at verse number 4. 1 Peter 5 verse 4. In 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 4, Peter writes there, he said, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. You might say, well, who does that go to? Well, look in verse number 1. It says, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is in among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. Be an example to the flock, in other words. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive the crown of glory that fadeth not away. So that, that's very obviously written to those that, that uh, the Lord's given uh, the ministry of overseeing the flock of God in some way. I, had, I read something one time about, um, and they could be right, uh, what about you know, deacons? Not just the ministers, but what about deacons who, who get up and minister in the Word and help uh, oversee the flock of God? What about those in other ministries, uh, like ch children's ministries, for example? Are they not God's flock too? That's a good question. Uh, I, don't, and I don't pretend to know the answer to that. It was a thought that I read one time, and I thought, hmm, it's an interesting thought. Who knows? Uh, I would tend to think that, that it says, what it says there, the elders which are among you, it's talking about the older, the older, uh, the older generation amongst the churches. It's funny, you know, I looked up the word elder in the, world, in the Webster's uh, Dictionary, the 1828 Dictionary. I thought, elder, oh, I'll just see what he's got to say. So I typed in elder, and up, up it comes, and it said, the only, the only, and this is the only answer for the word elder. It says, it's a species of duck. <laughs> and I went, yeah, I don't think I'm a species of a duck. So, uh, and it didn't, it didn't give any other explanation. So I looked up eldership, and it means the office or, of an elder or presbyter, which is someone advanced in age who has authority in the church and whose duty it is to feed the flock over whom the Lord has assigned to do so. And so that, that would indicate you know, ministers, deacons, or other senior members in the church that minister to the flock of God, but generally are the pastor or minister. So just in closing, you know, you stop and you think about it. For by grace, by the undeserved favour of God, by, the, by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. That's a, that's, you can't measure the value of that gift, eternal life. Which we have because of God's undeserved favour towards us, His grace. And then to go one step further and go, but hang on, just by, because we love Him, and in one or some of these areas, because of our love for Him, we, we, we go above and beyond in our walk with Him. He's going to give us a reward for that, a crown, just because we love Him and we want to serve Him, because we, because we, we love Him so that we want others to know about Him be sold in the towards them or, or the crown of righteousness because we love him we just keep fighting a good fight and, and, and we finish our course and keep the faith he give us a crown of righteousness because we love him we love his appearing when we see him we don't deserve that what was salvation again because of his undeserved favour his grace You know, it should be a challenge to us. 
He's done all for us and He wants to give us more. Do we take that for granted? Or is it a challenge to us? It should be a challenge to us. Anyway, let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for your great love for us. Lord, I'm sure, I'm absolutely sure, we don't grasp the depth of your love towards us and how much you yearn for us to have the victory to have a good eternity a great eternity with you and Father I just do pray as we uh, go from here this evening Lord that you would just work in, in our lives and help us to be more and more mindful of these things that we've looked at tonight Lord I, I think there could be nothing greater than to be found loving your appearing and not being ashamed that you're appearing. To be found loving you with all our heart, soul and mind when we first see you so that we can look at you in the eyes and, and know that you know we love you. So Father, I, I Lord, just do pray for the work of the Holy Spirit of God in our hearts and lives as we go from here this evening and Lord, throughout the week and on. Uh, in these things, and Lord, I just do thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord bless you, good evening.